those many of you who called. Welcome to another edition of We the People. This is Jerry Brown. My guest this hour is Gore Vidal, author of over 22 books, uh, movie star, movie writer, a former opponent of mine in the, the 1982 campaign. He lost to me. I lost to Pete Wilson. So we are linked in that um, political era of the past, which is, uh, I think, a long gone. Uh, Mr. Vidal also ran for Congress in 1960. He is related in some fashion that maybe he can explain to Jackie Kennedy, to the Aachenklaas clan. He um, has had... Uh, knowledge, friendships with people like Anais Nin, all sorts of writers. He's seen power up close. He's written about it. He knows his uh, grandfather was a senator from Oklahoma. His father was at West Point when he was born. Uh, a very interesting, uh, very rich, very diverse life. It's a pleasure to have you here with We the People. I'm from happy, Los Angeles. I am happy to be with we the people, as one of the people, and I think that uh, our long deferred debate of 1982 is now going to take place a mere 14 years late, but at least we deliver. We deliver. Good. Well, it wasn't much of a debate because my goal in that debate was just to get through it without any, without <laughs> suffering any slings and arrows. You did. I say this a little sorrowfully 14 years later, but here we are. I remember your principal charge in the 1982 Senate campaign, this was the primary, of course, was that I was the prisoner of my own ambition. Yes. <laughs> I think that was probably well observed. I was also interested in the B-2 bomber, with which you had a most unnatural affection all the way through. Uh, I did support the B-2 bomber, and I'll tell you why, because, uh, first of all, I thought I needed some defense... Uh, stuff in my bio. I had uh, a, I, uh, stuff is a, is a euphemism for money in the yeah, I did get, treasury. I did get money from Rockwell. In fact, I talked to the president of Rockwell, and I noticed that Alan Cranston was a big supporter of the B-1 bomber. And I went out and visited. Uh, they also made the space shuttle, and of course I like the space program. And I remember, I can't remember the fellow's name, but I recall either he or Alan Cranston saying, well, the b beautiful thing about the B-1 B bomber is it can be recalled. It's not like a <laughs> missile. So if you send it on its way to Russia, you can radio the pilot and say, come on back. And number two, you can use it for conventional bombing runs. Now, unfortunately, you could, you could never get back the money that went to pay for it. That was, that was the horrible thing. Well, not only And it goes on and on, I think. Well, it? I think the B-1 bomber is a classic case First of all, of how easily, how easy you can buy a politician. Mm -hmm. I don't think Rockwell gave me more than five thousand bucks. Maybe a couple of thousand more for their executives. I mean, it is pathetic how cheaply we <laughs> sell. We sell out. And that's number one. Uh, and then, of course, I rationalized because Alan Cranston was supposed to be the liberal, and he was actually a member of the World Federalists at one time in his life. Yes, I remember. And then the third point, which, uh, which is no big uh, surprise to people who listen to Pacifica Radio, but the B-1 bomber never flew. There's w there was 100 of them, three crashed, and 97 were grounded. And the, as I understand it, the last time I saw a report on the B-1 bomber, which is about 10 years ago, is the refrigeration, just to keep them at the right temperature, is something like a billion dollars a year. Well, it's, uh, it was a beautiful work of art, so, I mean... We look back on it along with the spruce goose of Howard Hughes, which was in the Second World War, one of those dodos. He at least spent his own money. But I thought then, and I think now, it could still, a politician might get some mileage out of it, to talk about conversion from a militarized economy uh, to a real economy. We became militarized in 1950 when Harry Truman decided that uh, we were to be forever. Not only, most of the budget would be military, but he put the Defense Department, he invented that, he invented the CIA, loyalty oaths, and so on. And it's, no politician has ever grasped it. And the only, the nearest I saw anybody come to it was you four years ago in Connecticut. And I was occasionally sending you a, a fax. And you hit, I had said all along, find a place where the government is about to terminate a contract, in this case it was a Seawolf submarine. Find a place where the workers, highly skilled workers, are going to be let go, and they're naturally angry. And say, no, we're going to keep you. We won't be let go. Make bullet trains instead of submarines. And you 
took the Connecticut primary with that one line. With a bit of luck, he might have taken the whole country once it had been explained to the people that something like $5 trillion had gone down the drain and they didn't have decent schools. No health care, because that's communist, to have health care for everybody. But that was, that's the beginning, until you transfer the money from Pentagon overruns and so on, not to mention the CIA, which should be, I think, dissolved. It's of no use. Great source of mischief. I don't see any point to the FBI, by and large. What are they there for? Collecting dossiers on justices of the Supreme Court? They used to be, at least in J. Edgar Hoover's time, uh, they were very good about uh, chasing automobiles across straight lines, you know, stolen automobiles. And they were pretty good on kidnapping, but that was about it. Now they're talking about dossiers on everybody. Why should there be one? Well, they have to check uh, everyone out for jobs. For example, if you're given a job on the, some kind of a monument commission, uh, they want to give you a drug test. They want to check your background. They want to interview your neighbors. And then they put that in the files. But the answer to that is, whose business? By what right? What an invasion of the privacy of the individual. I suppose if you were dealing with a very highly secret matter, you would want to check somebody out. In the absence of an official enemy like the Soviet Union, it's too much, and it's too expensive. Is there any evidence that there were these checks of people in the early presidency, in the early government of the United States? Do you have any knowledge no. of that? My, you know, the founding fathers were all foreign agents. Alexander Hamilton was British agent, I think, number 12. Aaron Burr was an agent for the French Directory, and General Wilkinson, the commanding general of the American Army at the time of President Jefferson, was a paid agent of the Spanish government, and our big enemy was, of course, the Spanish in Mexico. So here were three of the major figures, and many minor ones, were all on the take from foreign governments, and fairly open about it, you know. They would say, well, we're for the French because uh, we like the French Revolution. The Brits would say, well, we're, we're anti-revolution, we're conservative, so we, we are pro-British. That's gone on since the beginning, but uh, it wasn't until Truman decided that we were to be totally militarized, and that was National Security Council Act Number 68, which was done in, I think, 1948. They got an act through Congress, which didn't make much sense. 50, it was enacted. It wasn't until 73, under the Freedom of Information Act, anybody ever got to see this thing. Seven, there were seven points. One was that we, we never deal with the Soviet Union. We never have another meeting with them, because they were liars. Two, we go ahead with the hydrogen bomb, so that when they got the atom bomb, we would be that much ahead of them. And then the militarizing of everything. That we, that it would be under the government, most American industry. And the peacetime draft was also one of their great presents to us. And finally, the CIA, which has been making mischief to this day in every corner of the earth. Uh, I want to raise a point now that you, you talk about the hydrogen bomb and what have you. Uh, looking through the internet uh, in, uh, for information about the oversight board of the CIA activity in Guatemala, I came across something called the National Security Archive, which is a project that uncovers documents. And one of the documents that they had listed, which I downloaded, was a memo from a fellow named Gerard Smith, mm. Uh, Gerard Smith, I think, um, uh, was in the State Department. I believe he might have even headed up the American section in Cuba for a while. But he was a, a, a part of the establishment. He wrote a memo to Christian Herter, who yeah, was he the Secretary of State. He was the Secretary of State. This is 1957. <coughs> and the memo was about um, two islands called Quemoy and Matsu. Oh, yes. And in this memo, he quoted what was called the JCS planning document, or uh, and the JC, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the planning was that for the defense of Kwamoy and Matsu, if the Chinese were to, to uh, try to move on them, that the plan was to use low-yield nuclear weapons, 20,000 kilotons, which is the equivalent of what was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in this memo, Gerard Smith says to Christian Herter, if we do that, the Chinese can be expected to bomb the Seventh Fleet and Taiwan, in which case we will retaliate. Oh, one more thing I didn't mention, that the low kiloton uh, nuclear bombs would be dropped on Canton and Shanghai. Several million lives could be expected to be lost before it escalated, before there was any <laughs> retaliation. And so in this memo, this is 1957 now, before the 60 campaign, uh, Gerard Smith says, I recommend that we don't clarify our position, much less um, make it 
make it known or make it clear that we're committed to defend these two islands. Now, here's the point. When I remember the debate in 1960, when Jack Kennedy yeah, at, uh, said something about Komoi and Matsu, they weren't defending enough. Now, Kennedy must have known, because he gets briefed on this stuff, that the only way to defend those islands was with nuclear weapons. And the only way to do that is to kill millions of people. So then the question is, is this another piece of evidence of Jack Kennedy's recklessness? Well, not only reckless, he was a war lover. And he was taunting Nixon uh, all the way through about Kwamoy and Matsu, whoever stands strong there will hold the world in his hand. And, oh, I don't want to say that Senator Kennedy is a communist. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say he was a communist. This dumb, dumb debate went on and on, but what was under it was not dumb at all. Kennedy knew perfectly well there was no missile gap, that we were far ahead of the Soviet Union. Kennedy was basically, he, what he wanted in one sentence, and I knew him pretty well, he wanted to win the Cold War, preferably with a hot war. And he made a couple of attempts, the invasion of Cuba, which all went wrong. Yes, it was planned by the Eisenhower administration, but uh, he didn't have to say yes, and he didn't have to bungle it. He tries a war in Laos, and he can't get anybody interested in Laos. And then suddenly there's Vietnam, where we could stand tall. So, largely due in part to his father and Cardinal Spellman, who were in with the Diem family, who ran, who were Roman Catholics, who ran Vietnam, uh, we began to send advisors who were already there under Eisenhower. Jack just increased them, increased them. And uh, Pache, Oliver Stone, but Jack did not intend to take a little trip to Dallas and come back and st stop a war that he had just started. That's not the way the world works. He saw himself as a kind of culmination of history. He believed all of this idiotic rhetoric which Harry Truman had started, and Truman was totally cynical. Eisenhower was totally cynical. They knew the Russians weren't going anywhere. They were too weak. They knew it would be a generation before they were competition for us domestically, or even uh, militarily. In the long run, China might be dangerous, but there was no sign of any danger at that time. They were just a great mass of people. So they were acting out this very dangerous political international theater before the world for domestic uh, political reasons. On the one hand, which is okay, it's fair enough to lie to the American people, since most presidents do at one time or another, in good or bad faith, but to believe your lies. This is where men become dangerous. Adolf Hitler, I'm told, was a great administrator, but unfortunately he believed all of his ugly rhetoric and turned out to be a monster. Jack believed that war could be won. And he kept saying, and I remember I said to him once, I've counted in your speeches now, now in this twilight time. I said, what are you, you're 44 years old, what are you talking about twilight time? The United States is on top of the world with a number one economy, number one militarily, and you're doing twilight time. Well, one reason is he was dying. He was not going to make it to 50, I don't think. He might have, with great medicine, lived longer. He was physically fragile. Uh, he had a great fatalism. And, he, and why not have his moment of glory? After all, he said to me once, he said, what about, he said, what would Lincoln have been without the Civil War? I said, you think it's worth having your face on Mount Rushmore to kill 600,000 men in a war, as opposed to six billion perhaps, or 600 million in a war in Asia. He was just cockeyed, really, and uh, sad ending, very charming guy, intelligent. But if somebody that bright can get taken up by this rhetoric in politics, it's very s scary as you yourself know, having been in this particular trade at that presidential level. I, I, the impression I had of Kennedy, though, was one of pragmatism, cynical. Uh, the word they loved was tough. They liked Jesse Unruh in California because he was tough. <laughs> Pat Brown, he was soft. And those are the, the, those are the words that came out of the Kennedy era. Well, I must say it was Gene McCarthy who always has something sardonic to say about people. He couldn't stand the Kennedys. And he said, have you ever noticed about the Kennedys? Um, they only play touch football. I <laughs> played football. <laughs> so their toughness was all play acting. You know, they had, they had fixers. And they had uh, thugs, even, to uh, 
get things their way. Adlai Stevenson, as you know, was always that old woman. To them, if there's anything worse than a woman, it was an old woman, and that was Adlai Stevenson. No, they were uh, filled with contempt for the rest of the world, and uh, it was hubris, reminds you that the great sky god, if there is one, is probably Greek. <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned just that uh, you brought up Kennedy. I don't know whether you want to talk about it, but... Um, during this connection between Kennedy and the mob? Well, it's a, it's a great subject, and there's going to be a book about it and a TV special within a year by a very distinguished journalist who's been working on it for a number of years. And it goes back uh, to Jack's grandfather, the famous Honey Fitz, Fitzgerald, who was mayor of Boston at the time of Prohibition. And his honor, the mayor, all of bootleg uh, liquor went through the mayor's office, and the mayor got paid off, came down from Canada. Prostitution numbers, all this was the mayor was in charge of. Then his daughter uh, marries young Joe Kennedy out of Harvard. And meanwhile, his honor, the mayor, had, was being helped all the time by a young Italian from New York called Frank Costello. So then the torch sort of passes when Joe Kennedy comes into the family as a son-in-law, and they get him... Wait, wait, there, Frank, there is a connection between Frank Costello oh, yes. and Honey Fitz. Oh, yes. And this is not conjecture. This or, is not conjecture, and I'll, I'll tell you where it ends. So J Joe Kennedy comes into the family, and they get him a small bank, which is used largely for laundering money. He also gets into the bootleg business and later into the legitimate whiskey business. Makes his fortune. A now much older, but still quite young, Frank Costello is working with him. In due course, uh, to end up with that, well, I have no a man who was, once a week, Joe Kennedy, they had this apartment on Central Park South in New York, and he and Frank Costello, while his son was president, and Frank Costello, the retired head of the mob, they'd have dinner, just the two old guys. And there was a Joe guy, and Frank. Joe and Frank. And there was a guy who was a member of the Teamster Union who gave great massages. So this, he would come over and massage the two old guys. And sometimes they'd ask him to stay with them for dinner. And they would talk and chuckle over their crimes. And there's Jack down in Washington being a virtuous president. Now, to get more into politics, at the time of uh, the 1960 primaries, uh, Jack was having his problems with Hubert Humphrey, who really was the sort of liberal leader of the party. One minute. Uh, and was very strong in Wisconsin. And uh, so Jack had to make a great showing in the next state, which was West Virginia. West Virginia is a state where you buy the election, or at least in those days. Uh, cash is handed out. Cash came in by the floods. Everybody thought it was old Joe Kennedy, but he didn't have cash like that. It came from Sam John Connor, the head of the mob in Chicago. And uh, that connection went right on up until uh, who knows when. But Miss, Miss Exner, who was involved in it, was both the girlfriend of John Connor and of Kennedy. And she alleges to have uh, brought money from Chicago to Palm Beach. Is that, I knew they had a, they, the affair is out there. She's written the book that she had an affair with Sam Giancano and Kennedy. I'd never heard about the money. And meanwhile, John Connor, under the Eisenhower administration, had been working to kill Castro for the American government, for the Republican Party, to get back the casinos which had belonged to the mob, who were also part of his uh, chain of command. All right, let's just stop at that point. You're listening to We the People. I'm speaking with Gore Vidal. We'll be right back. This is 94.1 FM KPFA. The time is 420. Weekday mornings at 9 a.m. It's Democracy Now! Pacifico Radio's daily and grassroots election show. Harry Brown, who is the libertarian... Do you have anything to say on the subject of the assassination? In all 50 states yeah. in okay, because it in presidential debates this fall. might lead to that, then we'll go into other no. more generic things. Years, it's the largest third party in the U.S. Libertarians don't believe in government reform, they believe in government downsizing big time. That's an interview with libertarian hopeful Harry Brown, Tuesday on Democracy Now! at 9 a.m. here on KPFA 94.1 FM. Please stay tuned for more of We the People with Jerry Brown. 15 seconds, 10. Five seconds. Go. You're back with We the People. The number for those of you who would like to get more information, support, or join We the People, it's 800 
800-426-1112. Please write it down. Give us a call today. My guest is Gore Vidal. The subject, well, the subject is power. It's government. It's the Kennedys. It's the theater of illusion that the degenerate state of democracy has evolved to. Now, let me just follow a point here. You, you made a quick uh, comment here about the Republicans actually hiring the mafia, you said, to get the casinos back. That's very hard for a kind of a red-blooded, normal, middle-class American to believe that actually... And maybe you could elaborate on that. I have heard stories that, that um, the U.S. government, I guess it would be under Roosevelt or Truman, asked the mob to help with the campaign in Salerno or to mm. uh, do some stuff there in, uh, in, um, what is it, the, in Sicily, the Sis, uh, Sicilian campaign. But now, is there a connection? Does it go through? And does it tie into the Kennedy assassination? Uh, well, I think it, uh, as for the Eisenhower connection, that was simply... Uh frenzied anti-communism but back of it was money back of it was the mob so the old uh, latin question qui bono who benefits uh nixon was the white house vice president he was the white house man for cuba and they decided that it was a good idea to kill castro well how do you kill him well best thing to do is get the mob because the mob owned all the, the casinos in havana and the mob was very upset at, at losing to castro a great source of revenue so this, this has all been published. Uh, John, John Connor was working secretly to try and uh, do in Castro unsuccessfully. Is it Giancana or John Cano? Uh, in Italian, it's John Cana. I hear other variations of it, but the correct thing is John Cana. Okay. And um, that didn't work. And then, now, unknown to the CIA, this is one of the ironies, Kennedy is not only having an affair with his girlfriend, John Connor's girlfriend, but is getting money, thanks to his father's connection with Frank Costello, money is coming into the Kennedy campaign, particularly for the West Virginia primary. This was a, the greatest kept secret of all time at that time. Now, you ask about the assassination, I don't know anything more about it than anybody else, but it's, A, it's a, agreed that it was a conspiracy, certainly. Uh, again, who benefits? Who would want them, who would want to kill Jack? Well, one of the conditions of the mob when they gave money to Kennedy, thanks to their relationship with his father, leave us alone. Edgar Hoover never bothered us. Justice Department never goes near organized crime. We don't bother you, you don't bother us. It was a truth. Bobby just got overambitious in the Kennedy manner and decided that uh, he was going to be a white knight and he was going to go after organized crime. And if you remember, around 61 or 2, the Appalachian meeting in New York with the various mob leaders got together and Bobby got in on the act and some of them got uh, indicted whatever the mob did not take well to this what are you doing to us you know we gave you this money and so forth and so on and now you're going after us Joe Kennedy is alleged to have said well you know my boys are giant killers dragon killers they gotta have dragons to kill this was their death warrant so there's a conversation which has been recorded and much published between one of, the, one of the mobsters, a guy called Traficanti, and uh, Marcello, who was the head of the Louisiana mob, which in turn were involved with the casinos in Havana, which is nearby. And they're swearing at, at Bobby Kennedy, the attorney general, going after them. And they're talking about uh, killing him. And uh, Marcello says, I think it was Marcello, it was Traficanti, if a dog is bothering you, you don't cut off the tail. So you kill the president is what was the meaning of that, and I assume that the mob, who knows, Oswald, whatever, how it was done, but it was done. And um, one of the thing, reasons this hasn't come out yet, has only been alluded to, in, in 60, for the 64 election, they wanted to get rid of Johnson as vice president. And for a lot of reasons. Bobby particularly hated him. And Johnson is, was unsavory in many ways, but uh, he was terrified of the Kennedys. He knew of their mob connections. He thought they might kill him, and he knew they wanted him off the ticket, so he's sitting there very jittery. Why on earth would... Uh, they wanted to get rid of him, and the, the plan was never... I don't think the family ever agreed on it bef before Dallas, after Dallas, of course, it didn't exist. They wanted a Kennedy-Kennedy ticket. 
that Bobby Kennedy, the slayer of the uh, mafia in the United States, was crime killer, and Jack, the hero of the Western world. And that would have been hubris beyond belief, two brothers running president, vice president. That was in the air. I have a hunch they would not have gone through with it because not even the Kennedys could have pulled that one off. But all this is the atmosphere pre-Dallas. And then, of course, uh, hubris and uh, nemesis arrives. So let's look at the, the more general question about power. Um, wh you must have, you've written a lot about it, all these, these characters in your novels. I mean, there's certainly power is, is at the bottom. I mean, are we learning anything, or is just humankind perpetually going around in circles? Well, I don't think there's any upward route to be detected in the human race. It seems to be more of the same with lucky accidents and unlucky accidents. The desire for power is a perfectly natural one, and it's, all, it's because every human being, no matter what his background, has been powerless because he was a baby. And I suspect if you went into the psyche of Alexander the Great you know, or Jack Kennedy or anybody, Herbert Hoover, you would find out there was something in childhood powerlessness that he said to himself, never again am I going to be at the mercy of other people. Therefore, they let them be at my mercy, or however he would translate it into his head. There's nothing wrong with wanting power. It is to what end you want it, and how wise you are in the use of it, and how much you, I was going to say you know yourself, but nobody seems to do that, but how much you know what the world is that you would like to dominate, and what you might do about it, and would you be, uh, be of any use other than the pleasures of winning. The Kennedys never got beyond the pleasures of winning. I mean, nothing. They were blank as Teddy Kennedy revealed to Roger Mudd. Why do you want to be president? Ah, well, um, mm, yeah, ah. Uh, no answer. No, no answer. He didn't think there needed to be one, I suppose. So there, there was a real empty quality here, which stands in the minds of the American people as a great icon of elegance and grace and, and, and youthful vitality. And what you're really saying is behind all that, it, it's, it's emptiness. It reminds me of a... There's a, a McLeish poem where it end, I can't remember. It's like a circus tent, and and something about you. He looks up at the end of the poem, and and there, there, nothing at all, or something. It's uh, well, there's even a better McLeish line. A poem should not mean but be. <laughs> they didn't mean anything. They just were, and but that's true of uh, power in a country like this. It used to be that the great uh, powers in the nation uh, would choose a president for us, see to it that we elected one, who not only served their interests, but would also be a dignified uh, chief executive. And they, t they were respectful of the Constitution and of the division of powers. Then when you see, I think it really got bad under Nixon, when he s keeps sending these names of the Senate for the Supreme Court, each more ludicrous than the one before, each more insulting, with Bush finally with Clarence Thomas. I mean, it's just stunning. The contempt for the Supreme Court means you have a total contempt for the Constitution of the United States. It means you don't care about the country. They now have just made it very clear they don't care. They care about the people who give them the money to run, whether it is Bob Dole, character. That's what it's about, America, Bob Dole. That's all he says. Then cigarettes suddenly come up, and now we know that cigarettes are, you know, very serious to him. Okay, now, if, if these people are as pathetic as, as you're indicating... Is it just the nature of mass behavior that this is information or knowledge that can't be communicated beyond a relatively small class of people? I mean, that's a very uh, aristocratic uh, uh, perspective, and, I'm, and I would like to believe, and I'm hoping you're going to be able to find somewhere in your long experience that, yes, the people can form a judgment, well. and therefore democracy can function, and it isn't all just as um, the fellow from Baltimore said, bubis americanus. Well, it's, uh, it's more, it's not aristocratic. I mean, uh, this is a case that everybody who cares about the country wants everybody to have all the facts. Jefferson said, you know, if I had to choose between newspapers, good newspapers, and no government, I'd take the papers. The people at least would be informed. We, we give a hollow laugh at that today. The point is, information, people who might say things of the sort that you and I have been chatting about, are never going to be let on t prime time in America. Now, I have, I have here in my hand, a shame we are not on television, 
I got a letter from a Mark Halperin, a producer, ABC News Special Events, just a few days ago. The background is in 1968, I did a number of debates with William F. Buckley Jr. at the two conventions. He's been asked back every time. I have never been asked back by ABC or prime time for any election. Now he says, uh, he's writing to my agent, as you know, Mr. Vidal served as a commentator along with William F. Buckley, et cetera, et cetera. We would like to interview Mr. Vidal about his experiences at the 1968 Democratic Convention, about the distance, the direction of both he and the country have traveled, so forth and so on. Uh, we'd like to do an on-camera interview at Mr. Vidal's convenience. This was now June 7th. Now there's a desperate letter of June 25th to my agent. He says, lucky for me, you are in the right business to understand this, being an agent. A suddenly installed new executive producer has changed our plans. Before I had even contacted Mr. Vidal to arrange the interview with him that you and I had discussed, the segment was put on hold. Okay, now here it is, how the country is run. I'm not going to, Peter Jennings has tried to get me on because Buckley and I made ABC number one for the first time on prime time. Uh, Jennings tries every four. We have a running gag about it, you know. I said, what did they say this time? They said, oh, he'll just be outrageous. And Jennings said, well, would you give me an example? And, oh, no, you know, outrageous. It's because real subjects might come up, such as uh, who got what money for what, which is something you should talk about in politics, because then you understand what, why the politician supports what he does. But if you can't talk about it, you don't know. So what do you get? You get the fetus, the flag. Is, are cigarettes good for you? You've got subjects which are of no uh, national interest. They may be personal interest to people or religious interest. Government's about who collects what money for whom. You notice in recently, uh, and I've noticed this in the papers, in fact, I cut them out because I find it so bizarre. Uh, Bill Clinton has talked about three subjects recently. One, he's called for school uniforms for grammar school children. He's provided uh, last week a $10 million grant for truancy matters to try to keep kids in the school. And the third, he's done something or other about curfew, all three of which uh, small towns perhaps ought to take some interest in, at best, other than the parents in the local neighborhood. And yet, this is material that is picked up in the mainstream media and printed by the Associated Press all over America and not laughed off the page. No, and it's also a, not a federal matter. Nobody's pointed that out. The president is not in a position to say that a high school in Glendale, uh, the students must have uniforms or there must be a curfew. He can't say it. He has had no executive power to do this. This, this is the Tenth Amendment. It's left to the states to do this. So the, the media is, if you, I understand why he's doing it. He needs to prop up his moral oh, yeah. aura. School uniforms betoken conservatism. It doesn't irritate anybody, so it's a freebie and the press disseminates it. So what you really get is not discussion. You get images and moods that are transmitted electronically into the brains of the people, and then that reacts showing up in polls and, uh, and ultimately elections. No, now, that cannot be described as a free society well, governed by democratic uh, no, it's discussion. Not a, well, it's not a free society, and if I were... Oh, an ambitious Republican politician, I would just quote the president on this. You hear his voice, and over his voice will be over the Hitler Youth marching in their uniforms. This is totalitarian. This is the intrusion of the government into everybody's life. The government tells us we can't smoke marijuana. Why not? It's none of their business. Cigarettes they're bearing down on. They banned alcohol in 1919, gave us the worst crimes wave we've ever had until now. What is government doing in all these things? Well, you know, the, the Unabomber had a very important point to make in his treatise, which, uh, of course, no one talked about. They just talked about him and how he was caught and how he lived and the vegetables he grew and his rabbit or something. He talked about their, um, he talked about the fact that people were becoming domestic animals. And he said that's the most important issue in America today, the fact that the American people are being rendered into the status of domestic animals. And there is nobody who's even contesting that issue. That's the Unabomber. Yeah. And he's quite right. Those guys who went off to Michigan, I mean, they didn't go off to commit crimes, as far as I can tell. They wanted a way to get away from the FBI, the laws of the land that they didn't like, and there are more and more laws that people don't like. The government is on top of everybody. Their sex lives, their intake of this or that. Files on anybody who wants to be a janitor uh, at, a, at the Washington Monument. Why... 
do we allow this? We allow it, it really starts with Harry Truman to go back to the national security state. People got used to being, I like that phrase, domestic animals of um, the Unabomber. <laughs> they are domestic animals. Animal farm, we might call the United States now. I don't know anybody that I come across from one end of the country to the other who likes the way the place is run, whether they're conservative, whether they're liberal, bomb throwers, uh, quiet old ladies. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes the people in politics. Nobody likes Congress. Nobody likes the press, which sometimes gives the bad news, but generally gives the news that the ownership wants you to know. Now, when you finally get people so fed up, something's going to break. And I more and more, as I see all these prisons going up and everybody being sent off to prison, three strikes and so on, they are preparing really for a showdown with the American people. I mean, they're already talking about using for minor drug offenders the old army camps that are being shut down to pen them in. More animal farming. Uh, the animals are going to turn one day and bite. And uh, even now, perhaps, as we're chatting, there is some young boy or girl who will grow up and overthrow this government because uh, it is it has overthrown our old republic it seems to be doing its best to overthrow our bill of rights our constitution well tell tell me a little bit from the italian perspective there you had some powerful parties disintegrate you had this i remember the man who is now on trial uh, who was the prime minister many times andreotti andreotti i remember going and visiting mother teresa uh, at the vatican and I remember the Pope coming in and Mother Teresa being there. And there, Andriati, I was right there in his, in his blue suit. And he was very centrally located in this little uh, uh, plaza, a little outdoor spot next to the Vatican where Mother Teresa had opened some facility for the homeless or whatever it was. He was there. It was the dedication. And now he's on trial the whole Christian Democratic Party business. And before that, there was all this stuff about the Masons and P2. Does that shed any light on, on some of the things we're talking about and maybe what could happen here? Because those, that party structure, after all, did fall. Well, that uh, is all an aberration, though, because we gave them a constitution after Mussolini in 1945 right. and, uh, so that they could never have a dictatorship again, nor could they have really a democratic government. But we were imitating the founding fathers of the United States feared two things, a dictatorship and democracy. And our Constitution is so carefully designed that we will never have either one. So now we have this funny mess of a national security state which does tap our phones, keep track of us, keep files on us. 30 seconds. And how will it end? How will it end? Well, uh, it seems to me if the gov conservative party in Canada collapsed, if the Christian Democratic Party in Italy collapsed, if the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan collapsed, there may be some hope for the United States. And it may well be that both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party have collapsed already and nobody knows it because the press won't tell us. You're listening to We the People. I'm talking to Gore Vidal. We'll be right back. He's on trial for murder. Yeah. Four forty. Four point one FM KPFA. Coming up at five o'clock. Flashpoints. Counterspin is heard first. The weekly media watchdog program. This is KPFK Los Angeles. We're now behind the scenes with Corby Dahl and Jerry Brown. Would you like to any back on the next point that you'd like to? No, just whatever occurs to you. Don't listen to this part. Alabama School District. It's coming up at five o'clock. And this reminder, KPFA Summer Mini Thon is July 23rd through the 25th and 27th through the 28th. We need phone volunteers to answer the phones, 510-848-6767, extension 400, to sign up for a shift. Thanks a lot. Ten seconds. Five seconds. Go. You're back with We the People. Remember the number is 800-426-1112. Write it down. We depend on your interest, your support, and the way you take the first step for that is to call 800-426-1112. I'm talking to Gore Vidal, author of over 22 books, a candidate for both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate here in California in 1982, as well as um, a person who's had contact with many of the personalities and celebrities of the last 30 or 40 years. I, I bring up the Italian case because, in fact, what looked pretty solid fell apart. Now, maybe that's just the way that system was organized. Our parties 
seem well in place. I mean, the Republican, Democrat, people you say are tired of them, but somehow 80% of the people fall in the line and go for either one. But that doesn't mean that has to go on forever. No, and they, they don't have an alternative. I was the co-chairman of the People's Party with Dr. Spock, 1968-72. Just try and start a third party here. There are several of them at this very moment, third, fourth, fifth parties. Uh, everything is done to keep it possible. Italy, after the war, as our ward, uh, was given proportional re representation which meant that any small group of people who got together call themselves a party might end up with a couple of seats in, in the parliament. So they had so many parties that you had to put together these curious coalitions, and uh, Israel's having the same problems today. You put together these, these weird coalitions of people who don't get along, and you end up with no government, which for the Italians is brilliant. I've always said the genius of the American system was the separation of state from church genius of the Italian system is the separation of state from people. The Italians pay no attention to their government. The government has the big cars and the big ministries and the ministers are allowed to steal as much as they can get away with. And the people are left alone. They don't bother to pay taxes or very seldom. And it's enormously prosperous. Suddenly everything started to fall apart and the old democratic Christian party, which was you speak of Andreotti, seven times uh, prime minister. He goes back to the end of the war. And uh, he's now on charge, uh, up on a murder rap as the mafia. He was not only the Pope's man in government and head of the Democratic Christian Party, but he's also the mafia's man. How he, his conscience, and he's very intellectual, he's a brilliant man, and terribly, terribly sly. But uh, I don't know how he, in his heart he handles the two, but then it's the country that produced Machiavelli. Now it's a little more open and uh, more interesting people are emerging, but every country is owned by a ruling class, and the ruling class there are the Agnellis who own Fiat, and uh, they're about ten big families, and they own most of the country, and in the long run, what they want is what the country will get. They didn't take government too seriously until a number of shocks began to happen. The biggest being that they were no longer a principal American uh, military base. Uh, we're still there. We've got about six bases in Italy, but uh, with the fall of uh, the satanic Soviet Union, they no longer had any, any meaning. When you talk about a ruling class, I wonder in the United States what kind of a ruling class there really is because you have the stateless money, these corporate structures that, that give a bureaucratic mind that looks at how to in, increase the return on investment. That could be anybody. Does that, that translate into a ruling class oh, in, sure. in a traditional sense of the word? Of course it does. And we've got one of the cleverest in the world. It's so clever nobody knows it's there. But it's something like 1% have most of the wealth of the country. About 20% are doing very well, and 80% are not doing so well. The actual, I'd say there are a dozen families, like the Rockefellers and the Mellons, who've been in the pews, the DuPonts. They've been in business a long, long time. The argument that you'll get from professional liberals like Arthur Schlesinger is, well, no DuPont has run DuPont in all these years. Well. I've actually had dinner at Nelson Rockefeller's house, and I can tell you, he didn't cook the, the dinner. Isn't that strange, you know? <laughs> you hire people to run these countries, these companies, and you also hire the Congresses, and, and indeed, finally, the presidents. So there they are. Now, between the 1%, there is the 19% who are doing very well. And that's the sort of, at one level, it's the Mandarin political class to which you belong and I belong, and we're hereditaries. Uh, that's a kind of patriciate which may be against the rulers or maybe for the rulers, but kept on short leash, very short leash. Then under that are the people who uh, who control opinion. These the uh, these are the colleges, the universities. Uh, you ever think why all of those the Harkness plan at Exeter, where I went to school, why all these rich people gave so much money to schools? We always thought, oh, so sentimental. They remembered their days, you know playing soccer on the green sword, not at all. They want to control the teaching of American history. And they, of course, they own the newspapers. So it, it's, it's not a conspiracy because they all think alike. They all go to the same prep schools, they go to the same colleges, they see each other, same boards of directors, same clubs, and they stay out of the news. Now, the thing tore apart when Nelson Rockefeller got the presidential bug. Rockefellers are not supposed to run for president. You buy the president, and you and on short term. You don't do it yourself, and it's embarrassing. The family was upset. 
In the case of Winthrop, his brother, who was having trouble, now dead, so there's no libel, but he was having trouble with women, he was having trouble with alcohol. He just wouldn't shape up, so they bought him West Virginia. Came pretty cheap to stay. They made Ar- that was Arkansas, I guess. No, I thought it was West No, no, Arkansas. The other one ran in West Virginia. Uh, John... Oh, Jay. Jay is in West Virginia. And w- the governor... Uh, uh, Winthrop, yeah, Winthrop got Arkansas. Yeah. Even cheaper state, actually, than West Virginia to buy. And he turned out to be a pretty good governor. Arkansas was happy, and he shaped up, stopped drinking, and it was very good for both of them. But by and large, the, the ownership stays out of it. In recent years, and it may be a sign, as you use the Henry Adams word, degradation of democracy that the rich, instead of playing polo and having yachts, are really are taking seats in the Senate. You had Heinz in, uh, from uh, Pennsylvania. You're getting all sorts of members of these great ruling class families are bored, and they think the Senate might be fun. I remember Jim Aberesk of South Dakota, a poor boy senator, and he told me he was sitting in a boring uh, committee meeting with uh, John Heinz of the 57 Varieties, who had spent seven million dollars at that moment, the highest amount anybody had ever spent for a Senate seat. And he said, why on earth did you spend all that money to sit here and we're bored to death, the two of us? He said, I'm poor, I had, I had no place to go. And Heinz said, Jim, you don't understand. It was just play money. <laughs> Monopoly. It's play money, and I guess it, it works for a while, but as in the Winter Palace in 1917 in Russia, things collapse and uh, can you judge where we are on that continuum between complacency and arrogance that works and then when it becomes so out of out of phase with where people are and what they're feeling and a sense of indignation and justice that shows up uh, with some historical regularity well i think it will be almost like russia you know it um, the winter palace would not have been stormed and the communists would not have come in the bolsheviks had it not been for the disasters, external disasters, like World War I. Well, I think in our case, it's going to be the rise of China as the great power, which is, I think, inexorable in in the coming century. And the United States will just be poorer and poorer. And as we begin to descend the economic scale, ending up probably somewhere between Argentina and Brazil, then you will see all sorts of uh, Brazilian or Argentinian style politics there. There's a strong fascist tendency in the United States, always has been. And it doesn't take much to activate it. So suddenly, and, and constantly uh, scapegoating. Oh, it's the fault of the blacks, the boat people, the this, the that. There's always a group that's uh, being uh, satanized. So they always have somebody to blame. And it's very easy when, when there are no jobs and there's not much hope Somebody, uh, this couple was asked uh, the other day I saw on television, they said, well, there are plenty of jobs, middle-aged couple, and they said, oh, yes, there are plenty of jobs. My husband and I, we have four of them, but we don't have as much income as we had 20 years ago when just he worked. You know, I was thinking what in Guatemala and in El Salvador, both client states, El Salvador got several billion, Guatemala got a steady, small flow of, of money, but right to the security services. In those two countries... Uh, nuns, labor leaders, cooperative um, uh, people founding uh, co-ops of one kind or another, uh, kindergarten teachers, were assassinated because the uh, ruling people felt a threat. And I'm trying to understand, okay, that's within the sphere of influence of the United States, highly connected to our intelligence agencies, therefore they know about it, therefore it's not something that's offensive to the powers that be. In this country, dissent is allowed. I want to try this hypothesis. Is it, do you think it's because the dissent has no impact? Is it because it's just like a bubble? It's there, there's a Jesse Jackson, there's a, there's a, I don't know who, there's, there's people out there on the left or the right, but they don't seem to alter anything, and therefore it's kind of harmless, very minor diversion from the general thrust of where things are going. But if it were ever to be that there was an actual threat, to, to the ruling class or to the organization of power as it exists today, why would there be different treatment for Americans than are given to Guatemalans or El Salvadorians under the watchful eye of, of the leadership of this country? Well, in, within the country, uh, our rulers have figured out that uh, you can write anything you want for the nation, which I write for, and the circulation maybe 100,000. 
Uh, you can talk on alternative radio programs. Uh, certain TV is accessible. Uh, no one who has anything really vital to say about how the country is governed and can name names is ever going to be publicized. He'll be made a fool of. You went through your Governor Moonbeam period when you were trying to say some interesting things about the State of the Union. You're either demonized or you're ignored or you're trivialized. That's why I read the thing from ABC television. I can promise you I couldn't change the country, but let's say for six months I had uh, half an hour every evening on television to talk about what I wanted to do, well-researched and proving my points. They, they wouldn't recover from it because they'd be so busy trying to pick up the pieces or trying to silence this voice. No one has anything to say. That zoo on Sunday out of Washington is the most embarrassing thing I've ever said. I'm uh, Michael Kinsey on the left. I keep saying left of what, you know, and uh, Pat Buchanan on the right, you know. I mean, they're, they're idiotic. And they're just, uh, they're buffoons. Not they themselves personally. Some of them are highly Kinsey, rather bright, but they're there to make you think that there's dissent. And all of it is, is, is the new Secretary of Agriculture really too closely tied to the Tyson chicken business? Boy, isn't that riveting, you know. But not one word about the $300 billion we waste on, uh, on procurement at the Pentagon. That's a non-subject because uh, too many of the sponsors are involved in that. No, we, we, we have dissent here because there's so much of it, it doesn't matter. It's drowned out, and it never will get on prime time. Down there among our wards in Latin America, we've always ruled through thugs. We, we just kill people, you know. I was there when Arbenz was overthrown. You were actually there in 54? Yes, and I, I had a house there in 1949. And I knew Erevalo, who was a freely elected president before Arbenz. Arbenz was, uh, Arevalo served his term. Arbenz was elected in a free election. They expropriated some land of the United Fruit Company uh, which they, United Fruit wasn't using for, to give to people. Uh, they paid United Fruit for it. Uh, they did have a sense of humor. They, <laughs> they paid United Fruit the price that United Fruit said the land was worth, which was ludicrous, but they, they walked into that one. Suddenly, we start hearing noises in Washington. Arbenz is a communist. He wasn't a communist. He was a soda. Actually, the person he was trying to emulate was Franklin Roosevelt. He wanted a new deal for Guatemala. Then suddenly, Henry Cabot Lodge, senator from uh, Massachusetts, gets up in the Senate and says, this is a communist regime. It must be stopped. And he gets to his friend Eisenhower and Alan Dulles of the CIA. And Arbenz is overthrown by the CIA. They actually brought in airplanes and so on and drove him out. Henry Cabot Lodge forgot to mention that he was a director of the United Fruit Company. And no newspaper mentioned why he was uh, so urgent on this. Did, and didn't the Dulles brothers have legal connections to some of the law firms that represented United Fruit? Oh, I well, they were totally involved with them. I mean, in fact, I think United Fruit at one point, their headquarters was officially in New Orleans, but I think Massachusetts was back of it. But they had some Wall Street, big fancy law firms, and, um, and uh, Secretary of State Dulles was a lawyer, no and he was in one of those big law firms. And I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that wa that his law firm was involved. Was uh, a legal had legal business and with the, and the Secretary of State's brother is the head of the CIA, Alan Dulles. So it, and there's Henry Cabot Lodge. Three men forced the President Eisenhower uh, to overthrow a duly elected Democratic president of Guatemala, and a bloodbath ever since for which we are responsible. And very little discussion. No no apology by Clinton. And no acknowledgement by Bush. Even Jimmy Carter and his human rights discussions at the Carter Center isn't really highlighting uh, the massacre that goes on. Well, he doesn't know it. Or if he doesn't know it, he doesn't know how to, how to present it. Okay, so we've got just a couple of minutes left. I want to ask this question. Having heard all this, now, what's your feeling about the common life together? Are, are you cynical? Are, is it to give you a joy? Do you, I, want, I want something out of your soul here that is human and, and uh, maybe not positive, but just... What do you say in the face of all this? Well, I say that um, eternity is a very long time, if it could be called time, and that the human race is just uh, a passing fancy. Uh, we were preceded by viruses. It looks like the viruses will probably kill us all. Bacteria of some kind, they have long, long lives, along with cockroaches. And I was never one to take the idea of the human race at all seriously. 
to me, we're just another form of rather chattering, chattering monkeys. Uh, I don't believe in afterlife, but I, it was why I believe all the more uh, deeply in this life as being the one thing that we can affect. And why I am in a state of you know, continuous high blood pressure outrage at how badly we screw everything up in the United States, which was basically the most blessed of countries. It was a, well, the <laughs> Native Americans to one side, but it was a fairly empty place for a lot of Europeans and then Asians and so on to come to. How we have, could have come to this, all because of the theater of something called the Cold War and the profits that it made for defense industries, uh, is a tragedy that I have lived through in my life. I've seen, I saw the high noon. I, I got out of the army in 1946. I was in the Pacific. I remember 45 as the moment when we were the, the, great, the first global empire. And we were absolutely unbeatable, the greatest economy. And here we sit 50 years later and look at it. All I hope is uh, that uh, something will happen that will change it for the better, and that is somebody who may be listening to us now. Well, and of course, there has to be a possibility of change, and it's going on a long time. There are um, ups and downs. You've heard a little bit of the down, maybe more than you wanted to hear, but there's also an up out there. And those of you listening, take it to your heart, think about it, reflect on it. Gore Vidal, thank you very much. Very fascinating hour. Thank you. And uh, thank you... Uh, all the rest of you who've made this work, I'm looking at a whole battery of people down here in, at KPFK in Los Angeles and those of you in uh, KPFA. Thank you very much. We'll be with you tomorrow. This is Jerry Brown for We the People.